Hey everybody, welcome to Gringo Glot today in English. We have a very special guest with us. I'll be talking with Brent Van Arsdale from the website language101.com. Uh, Brent and I, we just met as I'm enrolled in his Canadian French course. And Brent, thank you very much for being with me on my channel. Um, I wanted to give you just a second to introduce yourself and, and your website. Hello, we are a spaced repetition website for learning all the common languages that you might be interested in learning, most common ones. But we have a couple like Danish and Italian that are still in the list. When I met Brent just this past week, uh, we had a really good conversation. He was introducing me to his material. And part of that conversation, Brent just happened to mention Mormon or, or Latter-day Saint missionaries. And so I um, responded that I actually, that's how I learned Spanish, was serving a mission in Guatemala and and I actually did a video on my channel talking about learning a mission or learning a language as a missionary and so one of we both we commiserated together a little bit about how lots of return Latter-day Saint missionaries lose their language after the mission and so that's gonna be our topic today is how to help missionaries maintain their language so Brent how have you like gotten so how have you interacted with missionaries just so other people will get to know you a little bit better Okay, so I'm a world traveler. I've been to a lot of places, a lot, mostly in Central America and Eastern Europe, and uh, lived in Ukraine for several years, spent enough time in various parts of Central America to consider myself living there for different times, Guatemala and Mexico. Um, and I would often run into the Mormon missionaries in those countries. I like to talk. Often there weren't <laughs> any Americans around. In the town where I was living in, in Lutsk, Ukraine, uh, there were almost no other Americans in town, and so I would love to talk to them in English and stuff like that. Oh. And they, and you know, I was aware and, and would talk to them in Spanish, and, and was always impressed. If I was in Central America, I'd talk to them in Spanish. Um, in um, um, Ukraine, they all spoke Ukrainian, and I had sort of gotten quite far on Russian, which served me well in the same town. But people either spoke Russian or Ukrainian. The missionaries had usually. Uh, learned well missionaries had always learned ukrainian in that part of ukraine and um so they um but they but i was always impressed with the hard work and the high levels of skills that they had um mastered then i'd come back to the united states for vacation travel and talk to some of these same people back in the united mm -hmm. states and they they invariably lost it <laughs> there's even church videos talking about how little the people know you know, 10 years after a mission. And um, don't be one of those people. <laughs> if you've done something, I, I think the world is improved for the goodness of what you've learned and the richness that that can bring to the world. Don't lose it. So we're here to tell you today how to not lose it. And the same thing applies to someone just completing like a bachelor's degree in Spanish, a master's degree in Spanish. If you don't end up getting a job in this, field and you might not right you might take your liberal arts degree in spanish and then find a job in some other area you're going to need to do something like a 30 minute a day five day a week program to maintain and grow your skills so brent in in my opinion part of the problem is that uh, when you're on a mission it's kind of just given to you you're you're immersed in the language you have a language partner with you 24 7 that's usually a native and you're told to speak with everyone which is just like a perfect formula but you're not really given any tools for what you should do after you come home and I've struggled with that for like the past 15 years since my mission is how to keep up my Spanish. So Brent, this is your opportunity. What would you say to those return missionaries to help them maintain their language after the mission? Okay, so our, our concept in the United States, we usually have the concept of either you're the tortoise or the hare. And missionary training school plus your mission is the incredibly good example of the hare. You know, it's the <laughs> intense study you're out there doing it every day. You're talking it. Uh, you know, 24 hours a day if you could, and trying to dream in the language. And then you come back to the United States, the mission is over. You'd like to maintain it. You just don't know how. Exactly. So let me give you my experience with both slow and fast progress in Spanish. Um, I've used my spaced repetition software to make very good progress in Spanish, but you need to piece all these things together. And so what I've done for the last three years is find a good Mexican Spanish teacher that I liked. And essentially for most of three years, did nothing but 30 minutes a day, five days per week with a Spanish teacher, plug in your favorite language, 
the language of your mission, and that is by itself enough to make you have slow and steady progress if you do nothing else. So I think that's a key thing. If you do nothing other than 30 minutes a day, five days per week, you're going to maintain what you know and make slow progress. And most people, you know, could fit that into a normal life back home. Exactly. Awesome. And um, some languages are obviously a little bit more challenging to maintain than others. Um, I think part of it is also sometimes the cost, sometimes the time zone difference. So what would you say for someone that maybe is their language is, you know, uh, mainly spoken on the other side of the world and it's hard to find a language partner? Do you have secondary advice for someone in that situation? Well, okay, so especially as you're on your mission, if you're on your mission, if your mission is about coming close to coming to a close, start trying to line up mm. uh, teachers, probably paid, you're probably gonna need to pay these people mm -hmm. in your country. And especially if you're dealing with something that's a minority language, you're, you're out there learning Swahili or Finnish or something that's just not really commonly spoken in the United States, uh, you know, that gives you an, one more opportunity. Um, one thing that you can do now that's not, a, wasn't available 20 years ago is there's a great number of sites for finding tutors online, like italki. We both use italki. Yeah. I sometimes teach English on italki and, um, but I've also used it to find Spanish teachers and it's what I did when I did a Spanish intensive last year. Yeah, perfect. So that kind of segues into what I wanted to share about, about me personally is that, after the mission in Guatemala, I went to uh, the largest Latter-day Saint University, which is Brigham Young University, which has an amazing language program, um, partially because of all the return missionaries. And I thought that was kind of my only option to maintain my language was to minor in Spanish. And so that's what I did. And, and I don't regret that decision. But at the same time, I wish I would have still used that time to learn how I would then maintain my language after the school. Because in school, sure, I, I got better grammar. I was, you know, refining my language skills, but I still wasn't like getting a routine of like, this is how I'm going to maintain my language after I graduate. And so my biggest mistake I feel like was that after I graduated, all I did was kind of read grammar books and not really, I never found, you know, language partners. I just kind of took whatever opportunities came to me naturally. Like I would attend our Spanish uh, church and but that's only you know once a week for like an hour and so i mean those are kind of the mistakes i made but what do you think are the most common like mistakes that return missionaries make um that impedes them or, or causes them to lose the language is it just not practicing it enough no you're, obviously it's not practicing enough but it's not realizing what's possible and also not knowing what the necessary minimum is to yeah. maintain and grow so say you're only able to contact with, with Spanish is once a week for an hour at Spanish church. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's not going to cut it. it yeah. you're, you won't be there. Uh, three hours a week, you might be there. Um, and But from my own experience and the experience of several other people I've recommended this to, 30 minutes a day, five days, days a week is, is enough to maintain and grow your um, language skills. What I do is I have looked for teachers, find a teacher that you like, find a teacher, someone who genuinely adds value to your life, even if you're talking English, right? So mm -hmm. someone who's smart, who's interesting, who's fun to talk to, yeah. and pick that person, get on a regular schedule. Um, and then we got to come to the, the question of cost. Now, I was dealing with Spanish, which was pretty affordable for me. So at the moment... You're going to pay, you know, eight to twelve dollars an hour for Spanish teachers in Italki. You you can pay more if you want, um, but you don't have to pay more for teachers that are that are very good. Um, and so, um, but if you're going to, you know, French speaking Canada, or if you're going to Finland, some places where the countries have very high wages, you're going to need to. Yeah. Well, you might need to. Uh, put together a mini class and I don't see any reason that this couldn't be done. I just interviewed for a company who's providing remedial education to public schools and their business model is a small group tutoring with up to five students. So you take even the high wages of Finland or um, Canada 
and you split it, you know, two to five ways with uh, perhaps other return missionaries, uh, you should be able to get the cost down to a very affordable level. Even if you can't afford one-on-one -on -one tutoring, it should be effective enough to, to be in a small group. Very good. So Brent, I want to um, kind of spring an idea on you here. So the, there are kind of two big regrets for return missionaries. Um, maybe there are more, but in my case, there's two. One is okay. maintaining the language, and the okay. other one is maintaining contacts with the people where you served. Um, you know, historically, without Facebook, that was more challenging. But even with Facebook and social media, it's just, you know, it's a huge network of people that um, you meet on the mission. It's just kind of hard to stay in touch with everyone. But you mentioned, like, before you come home from the mission, you should be making connections with people that you could practice with. And I was just thinking, you know, for me, language exchange is a huge deal of, 30 minutes in one language and then 30 minutes teaching them English. And lots of people that you meet on a mission want to learn English. Um, okay. What do you think about that idea is like finding language partners that are people that you, you know, met on the mission and that you can not only stay in contact with, but you're helping each other learning languages. Is that, I don't know, to me, it seems like the best of both worlds, but what do you think about language exchange? It, 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 it's certainly a great thing. Assuming you've got, you know, the hour, um, mm -hmm it's pretty easy back in the United States to be richer in money than you are in time. Yes. And so if you do have the time to do it, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a statistical game as who will stick with you. Yes. And so, you know, try to come back from your mission with 10 people that you have um, corresponded with and, and do a practice lesson or two with them before you leave your country. I mean, there's no reason to, to wait until you come back to do your first yeah. practice lesson. Just, you know, do a practice lesson, get the details, get the bits and bytes flowing. And if, if you can, I mean, you know, you may not have the computer or something like that to do that with. But if you, if you can't do it immediately, you know, during the during the mission because you don't have a computer or something like that, then, you know, plan on doing it immediately back. Yeah, I mean, I haven't tried it, but I think it would be awesome if, like, you found somebody on your mission that you really like and you want to stay in contact with because a lot of missionaries I think are in denial, not only about how they're going to lose their language, but about how easy or hard it's going to be to stay in contact with somebody. So I think it'd be a really good thing for return missionaries to try to have language exchange. Um, but like you said, it's a statistical thing. It's really hard to keep those exchanges going long-term. So um, have a few people and hopefully you can really keep it strong with one of them. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, the missionaries are tend to be a smart, talented group. They're going to come back to the United States and either have money as a student or you have money as a job. Mm -hmm. And um, and the chance of if, if you're coming from a poorer country where your mission has been a country like Ukraine or something like that, it should be easy to find someone who who needs a job part time and can help you maintain the language. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so we mentioned like how. Um, for example, in my case, I would go to like the Spanish church and that was my um, exposure to Spanish, but that was still very, you know, religious Spanish and even right. quite formal Spanish. And those are two of, of the things that kind of drove me crazy when I realized when I came home and I was trying to speak Spanish to people like I worked on a on a road crew and and I would <laughs> talk Spanish with my coworkers and and a lot of them would give me a hard time because I was so formal and my vocab wasn't very diverse. So what do you do after the mission to like diversify your vocab? So it's not just you can teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can talk about anything and also to not sound like a robot speaking so formally to everyone. Well, let me tell you what I did in my in my time with my, my Spanish teacher, 30 minutes a day, five days a week. You know, if you're paying for this, you can do anything in that time that you want. Mm -hmm. And we had a the routine. The routine was. um we talk about whatever I was interested in the in that day, right? And and that eventually got me quite good at talking about everything that I was interested in. <laughs> nice. Um, and we all have our interests, right? You know, so if if politics was in that day because there was an election somewhere, um, or if there was a war coming up, you know, we talk about that. And um, the you know, so that was that was the format that I liked. Some teachers. Um, you know, have a, a teaching format and they want to plug you into exactly what they have in mind. Mm -hmm. It's okay if that's what you want, but I would say that you're probably a person with diverse interests yeah. and the more you can eventually, you know, if you talk about all those um, every day, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you're, you're eventually going to be quite good at talking about all those. Yeah. 
Um, one thing I've seen for a lot of return missionaries is they like to, when they use their language, it's like part of their gospel study time. So they might be reading church material in that language, which I think it's just because it's their comfort zone. They have that vocab. They can read, they can listen to church talks in that language, but they're not like wanting to stretch themselves and diversify. I think that, you know, the first thing is you, I'm, I'm guessing from what I've read, the first things you learn um, in, in missionary training school in the language is how to say, you know, would you like to pray? Would you, you know, that, that would you, you're, yeah. you're learning very, very specific religious vocabularies. And that's yeah. wonderful because that's an important part of life, but it's only a part of life. There's yeah. other parts of life too. Exactly. And so you're going to want to be able to talk about whatever comes up in, in the life that you're wanting to live. One thing that we have to clarify um, is that most missionaries that learn a second language are from the United States or Canada, from North America, right? Um, there, about half of missionaries are from those English-speaking countries. The other half are, you know, from the rest of the world. But it's really predominantly um, United States citizens that are learning second languages on their missions. And a lot of those missionaries go to countries like Brazil, we've mentioned, um, Portuguese, which is very similar to, to like other Romance languages. And so in my case, when I served Spanish, I had, I had studied French in high school. I mean, I didn't really know how to speak Spanish, but or French, but I had taken three years of it in high school. And so when I came back, I was like, oh, I want to become a polyglot. But, but I didn't really, since I didn't really know how to study Spanish, I definitely didn't know how to become a polyglot. So I minored in French as well, thinking that would help me. And, and again, I was, I was kind of lost after graduating of how to like maintain those languages. So what would you say to those missionaries that are ambitious? Maybe they learned a language that's not, that they feel like, oh, this could help me learn Spanish because Spanish is such a common language in the U.S. Um, what would your advice be for those missionaries that are trying to like maintain their mission language and maybe learn another language as well? Okay, so say you've, you've, you've gone off to Romania and you learned Romanian and there's not that much demand for Romanian in the United States, but Romanian is a Romance language. Mm -hmm. If you get any of the Romance languages, it's going to help you learn Spanish a lot easier. But even more than that, learning learning any language first will help you learn the next language, even if it's totally unrelated, like Chinese, because you've you've wired up your brain a little bit better. Now, the overlap, um, you know, there won't be any significant overlap between Chinese and Romanian, but yeah. um, knowing that you can do it is a key thing. My thinking would be to, to um, first of all, it's it's possible. And even if you've learned something that is that you're not likely to need back in the United States. It's going to help you learn something that you will need back in the United States, like Spanish, a lot. You know, so learning there's there's broad agreement in the language community that learning language number three is a lot harder than language number two, right? Mm -hmm. Or meaning your your second language after oh, yes. okay. your the the language you've you've grown up with. Um and um and I think that's true. I think that's true. I nice. my my first language that I started into learning was Russian. And I'm pretty conversational in Russian, and then I switched to Spanish, and Spanish was well, well Spanish was easier because there's more over overlap to English, but um, also I knew I could do it, knew how to do it, had better study methods, that kind of thing. Yeah. So let me talk about what you just mentioned. So um, I totally agree that if you've already learned, a, you know, a second language, uh, that that the next one's going to be easier for several reasons, and one of them is like that confidence that you gained. But the one that's challenging for return missionaries is is the method side because they didn't really learn methods per se on their mission of how to maintain or how to learn a new language. So like, because um, what you say is totally true. If you learn German, for example, I have a friend that learned German. Um, he, you know, if if maybe maintaining German seems too challenging or isn't a priority, um, learning Spanish you would think would be easier because he would know that he can learn a language and he would know what it takes to learn a language. But it's going back to that challenge of like missionaries don't come home with that skill set or that knowledge base of how to to not only maintain a language, but how to learn a next language. Do you think the 30 minutes, five days a week is enough to or, um, would you recommend more time than that or a different technique? OK, so what I recommend now is a combination of the tortoise and the hare. Mm -hmm. So um, periods of intense study. And by intense, I would call anything when you're really working on it quite hard for five hours a day or more. And, and that'll exhaust you. I mean, that'll exhaust you as much as a full-time job would exhaust you. And um, 
and then alternating that between intense and non-intense. So say you're going to dive into Spanish. Well, dive in with two weeks of intense study. Most people have two weeks of vacation. Mm -hmm. And um, any method that is uh, generally known to work. And, and by the way, there's many methods that, are, that don't work at all. So I want to encourage you to not bother learning uh, foreign words in isolation. Mm -hmm. Learning yeah. foreign words by themselves is not the same as learning the language. You need to learn at minimum phrases. And um, so any method that's known to work, I like spaced repetitions, what my software at language101.com uses. Um, but start with something intense and then go to the non-intense. And then you're, you're going to, the 30 minutes a day, five days a week is enough to keep you from losing. You know, maybe you're busy at work, busy at school. You can't, um, make more fast progress at least you're maintaining and making slow progress and that's that's very valuable to know that nice so we're kind of coming to the end of of our interview do you have any last words that you want to give to to return missionaries or people that are on their mission that need to that want to keep that language going what, what would be your last words uh, know that it's possible and when you know that it's possible, you got to know how to do it. And in my experience, 30 minutes a day, five days a week with a teacher you like is enough. Nice. If you can't afford it with a one-on-one -on -one teacher, uh, find a group, small group, two, three, four, five people, split it up, right? Perfect. Well, Brent, thanks again for taking this time to talk with me. Um, it's been super helpful, not only for me, but hopefully for all of our listeners. Um, I think it applies not just to, you know, Mormon missionaries, but anybody that, that maybe studied abroad and got a really high level and wants, but then their circumstances change and they need to see how to maintain the language, right? So yeah, absolutely. You just, you just finished a BS in Spanish. You're pretty competent on the day graduation is now keep it. This is exactly, how to keep it. Exactly. So, so Brent, thanks again. Could you, before we sign off, could you uh, remind people where they can find uh, your resources that you provide? Okay, come on and visit us at language101.com. We're a great way to get started with the language or with a new language. And also, uh, you can connect with me personally on LinkedIn. You can search for Brent Van Arsdell. And if it looks like me, it's me. <laughs> and so um, take a look at that and, and connect with me and try our demos and, and see if you like it. Cool. Well, thanks again, Brent. And thanks, everyone at home listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview with, with Brent and language101.com. And we'll be seeing each other next time.